So welcome to the second of the forum sessions. Uh, this is entitled, Carey's a Silent Epidemic. And this is a slightly different format from yesterday in that we're gonna have a panel discussion. My name is Nigel Pitts and I have the privilege of moderating that discussion. So uh, I'll give uh, a brief introduction. Uh, our president will then say a few words on behalf of the FDI and then we'll proceed to introduce the panel to you. So in terms of dental caries, to set the scene, uh, here's a page from the FDI Atlas and it's mapping dental caries. Uh, and that makes very clear that we still have a huge problem uh, with dental caries, much of it unrestored dental caries in many countries. And there's a very nice graph and a map looking at the burden of disease. But I'd like to point out that the measurement of that burden of disease ends in 1998. So we have a lot of difficulty uh, explaining and justifying the global pattern of caries when even the end stage data uh, is not consistent, not coherent, and not regularly collected. So it's a little difficult to put this in, in context in terms of the epidemiology. But as you will have heard yesterday, and I think we'll come back to it again with different resolutions, and the green agenda, the amalgam agenda. At the present time, unfortunately, we have no substitutes, no matter how clever, amalgam, resin, gold, uh, which are equal to the original tooth tissue. So the context of this discussion is we actually want to preserve and prevent natural tooth tissue because the substitutes are inadequate. And these days, restorative intervention is no longer seen as the best way to manage a disease process which is preventable. Uh, but unfortunately, the behavior, the payment system, the structure in many countries still favors and rewards uh, preventive or uh, restorative or surgical treatment rather than preventive. A point that came up yesterday was the lack in general terms of a glossary. Uh, it's very difficult on a global basis to talk about some of the concepts introduced in Vision 2020. It's even very difficult on a global context to talk about dental caries because so many of the words and labels we use are used differently. And when the uh, Global Caries Initiative kicked off at a, a caries conference in Rio, one of the requirements and recommendations was that we have an international glossary. Uh, one does exist, it's in, the, it's in this monograph, and that's been distributed by the FDI, uh, adopted by the Science Committee, and adopted by a number of other organizations worldwide. So in the debate, I, I hope we won't get into technical terms, we want to go above that, but you should know that we do have uh, a glossary of terms in FDI. I've been asked to summarize some of the current initiatives that are going on, and I think it's a very good time to have this discussion because there is a lot going on that can and should be brought together in some way. We have an ICDAS group, that's International Caries Detection and Assessment Group, that's been working uh, on an international basis for a decade, trying to get some standardization and evidence base into the way we detect and assess carious lesions. And that's led to uh, an international caries classification and management system, which I'll come back to a little, uh, in a little while. We also have the FDI Global Caries Initiative, which is now moving into its second phase, and there'll be more discussions about that at this meeting. We have an Alliance for a Cavity-Free Future, which I have the privilege of chairing, and that alliance kicked off at the FDI in Salvador, and on Friday morning, we're having our third uh, annual summit and briefing for the alliance. You heard yesterday from the IADR president that they have, as a global research organization, GoHera as an initiative around oral health inequalities, and there are two main um, areas to that initiative, one on recognizing and minimizing inequality in health and oral health, but also an implementation focus, trying to get research into everyday routine practice. And we also have, most recently, the FDI caries matrix, which I'll come back to, a way of mapping the, the, the different caries classification systems. So why are we wanting to have a discussion about caries? These are some of the points that led us to form the Alliance for a Cavity-Free Future. Caries is a global public health problem 
It has health, social, and economic consequences. We know what causes the problem. It's about sh sugar and carbohydrate increase uh, with, at the same time, poor oral hygiene. And yet we know that despite the efforts of organized dentistry, many countries are struggling to contain or control the caries process. So we need to move forward. We need to look at caries in a new way as some sort of continuum, looking at early stage disease to control it before cavities happen, before restorations are needed. And part of what the Alliance is doing is trying to energize people to say action is needed. We can't just tolerate the burden of what is now a, seen as a preventable disease. So here's the um, FDI caries matrix. And all I want to draw your attention to here is there are three different levels, all of which are valid, measuring caries either in a classical way as sound or disease, the mid-level dividing caries into three or four areas, and the bottom level with ICDAS having six stages as we stage tumors, we stage other disease entities staging caries in a way that's linked to the histology and the evidence. So that's a useful way, it's the start of a process to communicate. Now this next slide has two elements. I'll take the top part first, and the wording there is from the Global Carriers Initiative, and it's the goal to improve oral health through the implementation of, to many people, a new paradigm, but not all. Some people, some countries, some systems have been doing this for some time. But on the left, we have parallel, upstream, common risk factor approaches which you heard a little bit about and can see in that 2020 document. To the right, we're trying to work in concert with other improvements in oral health and general health. So this is working at the public health level, the population level. But at the bottom of the slide, we also have to try and orientate the dentists and the dental health, oral health teams to be able to manage caries in different ways systematically looking at information about patients, detecting, looking at activity, using appropriate risk assessment. And the part that's been neglected is the synthesis and the decision making. And then that leads to a portfolio of clinical treatments, not just restorative treatment, but a whole range of preventive treatments that the dental team can use. Now those debates have been going on in the different silos, the different parts of dentistry. The challenge we have is to try and link the upstream and the downstream so that everybody is pointing in the same direction, trying to improve health and trying to control dental caries. Uh, the message for today is that caries is wider than just dentistry. Just doing what we've been doing is not sufficient to get a significant and dramatic change, which is what we need. And some of the issues that uh, this panel has been talking about and others are talking about are the link between oral health and health, the link to well-being, <coughs> the recent inclusion of caries as an NCD, part of the chronic diseases framework, the document that you discussed yesterday, Vision 2020, engagement with public health, looking at real economic assessments of the different ways of controlling caries, understanding that physicians and their teams have a role to play in caries prevention and management, particularly with very young children that are seen by them before they come typically to a dental team. And Again, uh, an area where I think FDI is opening the door, looking at how we can learn from others. How does the progress made in tobacco, in diabetes, in control of other chronic diseases, how can we learn from what others have done and apply that to oral health and dental caries? So those are the sorts of things that we want to discuss in this panel. And before we introduce the panel, I'd like to ask our president to say a few words. Orlando. Good morning, good morning colleagues, good morning to the panelists. Uh, Nigel, thank you very much for moderating this session. It's very much appreciated. I'd like to take the opportunity also to uh, uh, recognize the collaboration and the support of Colgate Company and from our Executive Director of FDI, uh, Jean-Luc Aizelier, for all the efforts put in this panel. Uh, I will 
pick two sentences of this Vision 2020 draft document that was presented yesterday. Uh, they are very known from you, but I, I think are very illustrative of the level of problem that we are here discussing and facing. Worldwide, oral disease is the fourth most expensive disease to treat. Dental caries affect most adults and 60 to 90 percent of school children, leading to millions of lost school days each year and remains one of the most common chronic diseases. And as a dentist established for 25 years, I'm doing 25 years graduation this year, uh, this next sentence is very, I'm sure, is very sensitive to me and to my colleagues all over the world. To ensure, is in the document also, fair and uh, appropriate remuneration for care that delivers measurable health outcomes, thereby shifting the focus from a preliminary procedure-based remuneration model to models which fostered for a holistic approach to oral health care and consider promotion, prevention, and treatment as equally important. I don't see this level of approach in almost any part of the world in terms of insurance, remuneration, in terms of national health systems, even in terms of private practice. And I would finish, Nigel, with those, this dentist. Thank you very much. Should I have the microphones on? Thanks. If I could now ask the panel to introduce themselves. What we have here is the benefit of a rich range of different experience from outside of dentistry that can help us in what will be an informal discussion around the issues about how do we make a difference, how do we move towards models that Orlando has said are not yet prevalent in many, many countries. Uh, there's a few exceptions, but for most of our uh, national dental associations, we're struggling with remuneration systems which don't match what we're trying to achieve with dental caries, and we're struggling just within dentistry to control a disease where the determinants are far wider. So please, if we can start with Jim. Good morning, my name is Jim Chauvin. I, my day job is Director of Policy at the Canadian Public Health Association. My volunteer work is with the World Federation of Public Health Associations, and I am the current president for 2014, uh, 2012 to 2014. Thank you. Good morning. Um, Daja hao, Dage ho. Dosan, Ohio. Uh, my name is Paige Lin. I'm assistant professor in the Center for the Evaluation of Value and Risk in Health at Tufts Medical Center in Boston. Um, my background is health policy and management. I'm also a health economist and health services researcher. I'm very interested in the economic side of um, disease and I'm also interested in the cost effectiveness analysis. Um, I look forward to the conversation. Good morning. My name is Pati Pantumanit uh, from Thailand. I was uh, uh, from and dean of the two dental schools in, Tha in Thailand. And personally, I'm the, uh, a member of the World Dental Development and Health Promotion Committee of the FDI. And also, I uh, have been uh, working as a uh, one of the, the member of the uh, oral health panel, uh, expert panel of the WHO for uh, many years. Uh, so I would like to share with you some of the uh, works in Thailand. Good morning. My name is Jaime Edelson. I'm from Mexico. Uh, I'm past president of the Mexican Dental Association and chair of the Mexican Dental Association Foundation. Uh, I'm a counselor for the FDI. And uh, I'm very interested in uh, promoting uh, the voice of dentistry worldwide. Good morning. Good morning. My name is uh, Donald Lee. I'm a family physician in practice. I'm also the president of the World Organization of Family Doctors, known as Wonka, of the Asia uh, <coughs> Pacific region. I'm somewhat involved in dentistry, although I never practiced it, in that I helped set up the specialty of family dentistry uh, of the faculty of, of the, the, the Hong Kong uh, dental faculty. 
I look forward to some fruitful discussions. As I know, uh, physicians actually have a responsibility and role in the prevention of, of caries, dental caries. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to the panelists. Um, Orlando and I have had the chance to uh, paint a picture. I'd like each of the panelists to, having been confronted with the topic of discussion today, from your own perspectives, what do you think are the key issues? Jim, could you start? Yes, well, first of all, I'm not a dentist, and I have to admit that uh, before we started our discussion, what, a year and a half ago, the concept of oral health was sort of in the back of my mind, but not at the front as a public health issue. And I think that I've come to recognize the uh, importance of, of oral health as a public health issue, that it's got to be integrated into our thinking within the public health world, but also how do we integrate the uh, dental professions within public health so that we have a, a uh, I, th I think, a very integrated, comprehensive view of what oral health is, the, the, the risks uh, around oral health for other diseases and the consequences, as you were mentioning, around uh, carry, you know, if we are not preventing caries in young children, what are the consequences and what are the impacts that have uh, on not only the health of people, but of course on our healthcare systems. I honestly don't know of any country that's not uh, worried about the budgets uh, consecrated to health care and primarily acute health care. Uh, how do we uh, prevent um, caries and oral diseases that will have a major impact on the healthcare system so that our healthcare systems are sustainable? So those are some of the major issues that I'm dealing with here. Thank you very much. And I think it's interesting to know that in the discussion with the public health community, many in public health haven't recognized oral health, so they're struggling to recognize this as an issue. At the same time, perhaps, we're struggling as dentists to communicate with them. So there's a two-way street, and we're feeling our way. But it's important that we do engage, I think. Paige. Um, I would like to um, echo my colleague panelist and provide my views from the economic perspective. So we have finite resources for healthcare, and the reality is that there are dental, many dental services and non-dental services to be considered for coverage. So to convince payers or any skeptical audience, we have to demonstrate the value of caries prevention by considering both the benefits and the cost. Um, there are three key points I would like to make with regard to the economics of caries prevention, value, targeting, and lifetime costs. So first value, I think we have to um, distinguish between cost saving and cost effective. So preventive care that decreases cost is cost saving, such as water fluoridation and many childhood um, immunizations. In other cases, the health benefits may not be large enough to completely offset the cost, but they are still sufficient to justify the added expense and provide good value for the investment. In other words, um, some prevention programs are cost effective and worthwhile, although they do not save money. Um, the second point I want to make is targeting. Whether um, any prevention saves money or is cost effective actually depends on the details of the program and the specific, con specific con um, population. Let me give you an example, um, diabetes screening. We know that um, patients with hypertension plus diabetes are um, at higher risk for expensive cardiovascular events. So um, screening programs targeting patients with hypertension is more cost effective than universal screening. Um, so how does this apply to um, caries prevention? Well, there are many different prevention strategies ranging from simple fluoridated um, toothpaste to more sophisticated techniques such as dental sealants and caries vaccines. Um, we learn from other disease areas that targeting high cost patients are more cost effective. Um, typically, um, so in the, in the case of caries, I think risk assessment is an important first step in targeting, which can also be used to guide clinical decision making. Um, other studies also suggest that high-risk patients may include um, pay people with um, low social economic status um, or um, they are unaware of their dental needs and have limited access to dental care, as well as pay um, people with poor dietary habits, poor nutrition, and high sugar intake. 
Um, the last thing I want to touch on is lifetime costs of carries. As you know, there can be serious consequences of carries. Um, like um, Dr. Pitt mentioned, carries are wider than dentistry. So this is important because the focus on certain prevention and early management um, would actually represent a more efficient use of healthcare resources as opposed to treatment. Um, we are more familiar with direct medical cost, but what is typically not considered um, in the equation are quality of life issues and indirect cost, meaning productivity loss. So um, this not only applies to adult patients themselves, but also um, parents who have to take their kids to dentists, for example. Um, so I think when evaluating the um, economic benefits and cost of caries prevention, we have to keep these issues in mind. Thank you very much. And I, I think it's really helpful to have that breadth of view because typically when the caries um, literature is examined and the, we have discussions within dentistry, the cost effective element has been looked at in a very narrow way. And it's often cost control, cost containment, short term. And these, these concepts that you share with us about value and is it worth the investment and the broader view, I think is a really important part of the economic debate, which I'm not sure that dentistry has yet really got into. So very useful. Thank you. Prasip. Thank you, Nacho. Uh, I wish I would do it. And I just follow up on doc, uh, Dr. Lin's uh, mention about the uh, carries and quality of life, uh, especially in, 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 in the student. Uh, in this region, we found that uh, the caries in, uh, in the primary teeth is very high, which might be um, uh, quite typical. Uh, this is the reason that I believe that uh, if we would like to work with uh, the caries prevention or control caries in the future, we have to uh, we start very young in the young children rather than, than, than we wait until they, they are grown up, something like that. So we, in, in, in Thailand now, we, we, we believe that, uh, and that, that because of the high carries in the children, so we are now working with, uh, with uh, um, the health profession, um, besides and, uh, and, and the dental profession with the, uh, with the uh, medical, uh, talking about the uh, use of the, uh, how to campaign on the sugar consumption uh, because of the obesity and problem also, you know. So, so together, we, if we campaign together, we found out that uh, it might be able to, uh, to make people more interesting and to, and to tackle the several things at the same time, not only the carries, but maybe combined with other activities as well. And the other point is, uh, is that uh, in, in Thailand, we have a system right now that we are lucky to, to have this, what we call the university, universal uh, health coverage. And that means that uh, the government will, will cover all the, and the care, the so treatment care. But uh, we are lucky enough that to convince uh, and the Ministry of Health and that, uh, we, that they, they set up a small fund for what we call dental, dental fund, which is mainly for prevention and promotion mainly, which I believe that uh, with this uh, fund, we may, may be able to, to develop something, right, especially for the student, for the sea lands, for the simple uh, uh, preventive restoration or something like that. But uh, overall, I believe that uh, uh, we, we're talking about uh, changing the paradigms and, and our mindset of the, of the people or the dentists. I think uh, we need some uh, uh, dental literacy for, for the people to understand the importance of the, uh, of the uh, uh, dent dentition, especially uh, many people in this region, they, they still believe that the primary teeth is just, we've gone out anyhow, we explore it and, and we've gone out now, so you, you don't have to take care of that. But I don't think it's, it's that true, that's really true. Because and, uh, if there's a caries uh, in, in the primary teeth, they will affect the growth of the student. And also I believe that the quality of life of the student will be affected as well. And we have some study I mentioned that uh, the high end weight of the student who have high caries will be uh, not as good as, uh, as uh, the, the, the caries free people, uh, student. So I, uh, over this, I think that maybe we have to go back to the dental school as a starting point, and because this is uh, the, the areas where they have to be a bit more emphasized on promotion and prevention, and, and not just uh, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the conventional uh, restoration and, 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 and surgery in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. A, a range of things that we'll come back to, I think. Um, very useful to have worked examples of <clears throat> from dentistry. We're looking at examples and learnings that we can find from outside of dentistry, but I think from what you described, there is already some 
very useful examples and you've asked a difficult and challenging question about what goes on in dental schools and is that appropriate for the sort of caries prevention we're trying to deliver and, and I think uh, like a wider debate on that. But thank you, President. Yami. Well, uh, I would like to engage this morning in, in another facet, uh, and is that uh, there is a saying, uh, it's known worldwide, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Uh, I think that dentistry itself is in part responsible for this epidemic, uh, for trying to solve it alone. Uh, the dentist, uh, I don't know if you remember this series, TV series from the 50s, The Lone Ranger. Uh, it's a guy that always comes and saves people. Uh, and uh, the dentist, as being the king of the operatory, the king or the god of the nine by nine feet, you know, that's the size of an operatory, uh, thinks that he can <coughs> save the world from carriers through that uh, little space. Uh, I was very glad that this uh, forum was called Carries a Silent Epidemic because uh, dentistry has really been silent about this epidemic. We have to raise the voice of dentistry, we have to reach out, we have to use other sources, we have to uh, stop being so micro managers of the disease, of the prevention, of the promotion. Uh, I also believe that there has to be a clear difference between preventing oral disease and promoting oral health. There are two different problems and they have been uh, mixed and by, trying, by doing this we do neither. Uh, or actually worse, we end up promoting oral disease and preventing oral health. Uh, this is not just a simple game of words, it's a reality. The ratio of dentists per, uh, the of, of, uh, amount of population per dentist is humongous, uh, especially in areas uh, like Africa, like South America, like many places in Asia, uh, that you know, people are not going to be able to get to the dentist in order to be taught how to take care of their teeth and in general of the health of their mouth. So we have to go out, we have to use teachers in the schools, we have to put uh, the oral health into the classroom from kindergarten on. Uh, uh, we've done it in Mexico, we started, and uh, we're gonna see results in a long time. Uh, of course, uh, this doesn't get votes. Caries doesn't get votes. And that also, that's also related to not having done the right mathematics around it. For many people, even for dentists, and especially for the public or the patients. Uh, it seems like losing a tooth is not more than losing a tooth. And since we have 28 or 32, if you count wisdom teeth, uh, you know, if you lose one, nothing happens. If you lose another one, doesn't happen. Nothing happens. You keep your eyes very much because you only have two. If you lose one eye, you lose 50% of your sight. Uh, you keep your heart, very, you, you love it very much because it's only one and it keeps you in this side of the twilight zone. But uh, I think that uh, the, re the real math is how much diabetes is there because of people that cannot chew uh, and, and nourish uh, the way they should. How much uh, people have gastritis and, 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 p and problems in the colon because they don't eat well and that's because they don't have enough teeth. How much people are obese because they don't nourish themselves uh, correctly. So there are a lot of diseases out there that haven't been linked correctly to oral disease. Uh, once that math is done, and once you can see how much money you can save by not having to treat uh, cardiovascular disease because it started with uh, pure, uh, pure oral hygiene, it ended up with high periodontal disease and uh, cardiovascular problems, loss of uh, uh, t uh, job time. Somebody, and I think this is the right place, should start doing the real math of the real cost of sequels of dental caries. Thank you again. And I think that goes back to the last point that Paige made, that we haven't looked at long-term consequences, long-term costs. Um, and to have a sensible debate with, with ministers, insurance companies, and others, we need to understand that. 
Your other point that was just sort of slipped in there, which I think is absolutely important, is to understand that the lead time for some improvements and health improvements is long and longer than a political cycle. So we have to find some way of advocating that politicians will understand and engage with, even though the benefit may be five, 10, 15 years down the line, and that's a challenge. Donald. Okay, I actually I agree with what has been said, and, and, and in a way, I'm making some statements along those lines. But first of all, family physicians are advocates of providing and promoting quality primary care through the provision of continuous, comprehensive, and holistic care, all right? Um, we feel ourselves as partners with dentists in the primary care team. Uh, I think all health care reforms now point towards advocating multidisciplinary team approach to integrated care of many, especially non-communicable disease and chronic diseases. Um, as primary, the first point of contact uh, family doctors and also dentists uh, have the unique of advantage of being able to provide anticipatory care and also opportunistic screening and also health education. However, this is easily said than done because this requires a change of attitude, I think, in providers and also behavioral changes in recipients of cares and also administrators. Just now we mentioned about remuneration and all that. I think that there's a, there needs to be a change in value system because preventive care in medicine, for example, commands little financial reward. The value systems of patients and all that, when you, when you do preventive measures, they feel that there's little value versus interventional uh, treatment. So I think through public education and, all, all, and other ways, and using every opportunity to promote this change in behavior and attitude is very important. Um, family physicians also support um, lobbying, for example, WHO and, and the United Nations in putting more priority into viewing dental caries as a NCD. And especially we now recognize a lot of medical consequences of dental caries besides those mentioned earlier quality of life, but also complications in elderly, such as the lowest or lower of self-esteem and also pneumonia. There was a, a recent in interesting publication of aspiration pneumonia related to dental caries. But anyway, many, many such examples. So we feel that you know, the medical profession, especially primary care doctors, should really work hand in hand with the dentist in, in, in uh, dental caries prevention. So that's a good news story. Just at the time we're reaching out and trying to work with family doctors, what you're telling us is, as part of the team and as part of the dynamic, this is the way in which primary care is headed anyway. And we should find a receptive audience. Hopefully. Hopefully. But that may vary country to country. Cultures and also patient expectations. And I think the, the culture, patient expectations, uh, having a debate with the wider public about what we're trying to do and what should be valued is, is a really important part of what's quite a large agenda. So let's turn now to the, the questions we've got listed here. We may not get through all of them, but I'd like you to react, please, to uh, the first question is, what do we need to know today to prevent and manage caries? Is, 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 are we, have we got gaps? Have we got things missing? Or do we actually already know? And it's open for the whole panel dentists or not, you know what I mean? Well, uh, I guess that the first message has to be that regardless of the very high incidence of dental caries, it is preventable, 100% preventable. It's just that the strategy that we've been using for the past 100 years is not working. Uh, a new paths, a new ways, a new doors have to be open, uh, and they include more uh, than just the dentist and his team includes the public, includes the media, includes the politicians. Uh, it's, a, it's a big effort. We, we chat last night about what's happening with smoking. And uh, of course, smoking tends to be, the, the problems with smoking ten, tend to be more, more uh, receptive because many people know somebody who died from lung cancer because he was a passive smoker or a smoker. And that 
uh, who, who thought 10 years ago that we would be able to go to a restaurant and enjoy the food without having somebody smoking a cigar or a cigarette in the next table? Now there are other places so they can smoke. Uh, and non-smokers have rights too, and now it's a, it, it's a shift, a complete shift. So 20 years ago, 10 years, 15 years ago, nobody ever thought that, that they would come. So I think that there is hope that the disease can be reduced, controlled, and 100% prevented. But it has to be a, since caries is a multifactorial disease, you need a multifactorial approach, not a single straight and dentist-based solution. We have to involve the whole health uh, apparatus uh, and, and, and society in order to stop this uh, epidemic. Thank you, Jim. Yes, thank you. Just to build on what Jaime was just saying, I, I think I, I support you totally, but I think we need to be thinking outside of the health box, and I think that's one of the challenges for all of us, whether we're you know, physicians, nurses, dentists, or public health advocates like myself. One of the things that I've come to appreciate uh, with many diseases is that it's not just a matter of technology. We have the technology, we have toothbrushes, we have fluoride toothpaste, we have dental floss, we have all the things we need to take care of our individual uh, teeth. But one of the issues that we're dealing with here is that dental caries is caused by so many factors outside of the technology and outside of the health box. We're dealing with issues of food security and food consumption. We're dealing with issues of income we're dealing with issues of job security, we're dealing with issues of housing, water supply and sanitation. And these are not areas that we as health people necessarily go out and get involved with. So I think it's transforming ourselves into thinking outside of our health box or health care box and reaching out to the other sectors and engaging with them and saying, you know, it's all well and good to be promoting uh, in schools and I support the school-based programs of good dental hygiene, but if the kids are going back to communities where there is not potable water, how are they going to be able to use the toothbrushes safely? Uh, it's like I've said to colleagues in dealing with immunization, we can check off all the immunizations and say we've immunized all the kids, but if they're dying of water-related diseases, well, we have a lot of dead immunized kids. Is that what we want? So I think it's the same if, you know, if we, we can go on and on with looking at the technologies to prevent caries, but I think we really have to step further back, very much upstream, and engage with the uh, other sectors and say, look, we've got a major issue here. It can be done. How do we do it with all of the other sectors? And then that means convincing the powers that are, our government colleagues, to put the resources into the prevention side in the different sectors as well. And maybe some of the money will not go into the health sector. Maybe it might go into water. Maybe it might go into housing. But it's going to have an impact on dental caries at some point. And I think that's a huge challenge for us. So we've not only got to get our act together inside the box, and we're not quite aligned there yet, but it's outside the box we could make most impact. Paige? Yeah, I totally agree. And um, I think for that to happen, um, incentives would be very important. For example, financial incentives. We want primary doctors, um, primary care doctors to um, work with dentists um, on caries prevention. But on their to-do list, they have diabetes to check, they have um, cognitive um, assessment, they have a million other things on the list. So how do we um, make that happen? I think, um, I, I don't have the solution, but it's something to think about the incentives. And, and I think the debate, um, we'll come back to Donald then prior to it, the debate uh, picks up on some of the recurring issues yesterday. We need a, a global framework, but if it's going to work, it has to be negotiated and empowered locally, otherwise it's, it's not going to be sustainable. So I think uh, Donald was first then prior to it. So it's really opportunistic screening as well, the attitude, as I said, the change. For example, from a doctor's point of view, we always teach our family doctors that despite of what the patient comes to see you, there are a few things that you should always ask, like for example, smoking, checking their blood pressure, uh, family history, all these you know, risk assessments. So we should include, you know, have you checked your teeth? You know, one simple word I think would make a lot of difference. You know? And also, do you watch your diet according to you know, the dental health? So this is from the provider. But I agree totally, I mean, administrators, that's why behavioral changes. Those, the politicians, even you know, the, the health ministers and all that, their attitude, the, the resource allocation, 
That's another. But lastly, also the patient's attitude, whether they're receptive to this kind of anticipatory care. It takes time. And that also we need to work with educators, you know, schools teaching instead of I have a toothache, I go to see a dentist, is that I should see a dentist every year just to make sure everything is in order. This kind of behavioral change. Which takes time, as you say. Yes. Prati. Yes, uh, I, I think that's now said that we have uh, enough technology so far. But I, I would like to emphasize on, on the self-care and point of view. Because um, uh, any, any, when we're talking about the prevention, we cannot depend on any other people uh, uh, except ourselves, you know, on the family side, on the, uh, on the, on the community side, or even the self, uh, self side. Or so. and for example, you know, when we're talking about full ride, we have been using full ride for 50 or more years or some, something like that. But still, a lot of uh, carries around the world. What's, what's that mean? I think that we need to know how to make it used effectively, how to use it cost effectively, not just effectively, but cost effectively as well. There are ways to use at it. For example, I, I, we just uh, uh, organized together with the FDI, IDR, and the BHO uh, uh, workshop in, in Thailand uh, last year about the effective use of the full ride in, in Asia. We, we have some recommendations found out that, um, uh, citing from the literature, uh, toothbrushing is not that simple. If you're brushing and then you're rinsing a whole cup of, of water, the full ride all gone. So, so it's, uh, and that, that will not be there. And then if you, we have some survey and study that uh, in toothbrushing, most people will brush less than one minute. But we need uh, two minutes to be a, a bit more effective or something like that. So some point of this, you know, we are naked in the, in the, in the past. So I think that with this uh, the information, evidence-based information and scientific information like this, I think we can improve, especially on the self-care point of view. I would like to emphasize on that as well. Thank you. So uh, I think the, the message is we have the tools, but we're not necessarily using them effectively or to their optimal effectiveness. But those tools come to not just the dental office, it's the wider issues, self-care. Um, it's the public, not just patients, that we need to be addressing if we're going to have a sustainable impact. Let's move to how we might raise the profile of dental caries. We've said it's a silent epidemic. Um, you've mentioned, I mean, that dentists haven't communicated and engaged with caries as the size of problem it is. How are we going to raise the profile? Um, dentists may take the lead, may not. How, how should we be making this more of an issue? Well, Jim, you were talking about the health box. And I think dentistry has been in the safety zone, in the comfort zone, and don't move out of there because then, you know, it gets shaky. Uh, going back to the, to the Lone Ranger, you know, he used silver bullets to kill the, the bad guys, and a dentist uses silver fillings to kill the disease, uh, promoting it in a way. Uh, I think that uh, dentistry has to be humble enough to uh, recognize that we alone cannot deal with this uh, disease, that dentistry alone hasn't been able to control it for the last 50 years, uh, and that we, not that we need the help of uh, the rest of the healthcare, but that it's a joint venture, that we have to do it, we have to uh, probably the, the best word would be engage the rest of the health uh, community that, uh, you know, something as, as, as stupid as a hole in a tooth can create a huge uh, health problem and health expense along the next 20, 40, 50 years of that person. Uh, you know, we, we live in the area uh, in the time of communication and dentistry hasn't been able to communicate this to the medical and the medical has ignored the dental because it's only teeth. It's, it's sad, but how many pediatricians in the world still tell a mother, well, don't worry, you know, those are baby teeth. They're gonna, they're gonna go out. When the good ones come out, then is when you have to start caring. No, you have to care from the time the baby is in the womb, and then when it's born, and then, you know, it's an attitude that the disease can be stopped, but it has to be multi-approach. We have to get out of the box and, 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 and have the guts to live outside of the box. Not, it's not only to see what's happening there and then 
come back to our safety zone. We have to, to, to look at it from many faces if we really want the disease to be down. Otherwise, in 50 years time, in the 150th anniversary of FDI, some other people, some other young dentists, uh, we're gonna be gone, at least I will. Uh, and they're gonna be discussing the same thing because we keep doing things the same way and we expect different results. That's been proven to be impossible. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, on that, I think there are some uh, practical ways maybe we can move this on to the global agenda and our national agendas as well, because I know even in my country, Canada, I, I don't think enough attention is being paid to oral health, but we've, we have an interesting situation in Canada where our federal minister of health is from one of our northern territories. She is an Inuit person from Nunavut, the former minister of health in Nunavut. And dental caries is a huge, oral health is a huge issue in the north of Canada. She's championing it within the ministry, but there doesn't seem to be any resources available in the ministry to make things happen. So one of our challenges is how do we support the minister in her desire to make oral health and, and particularly caries prevention a major issue within the Canadian healthcare system? And I think that, that that's one area that, how, how do we, where there are champions, some silent champions, how do we get them out of, you know, out of the shroud, so to speak, and get their message up there? I think a second thing, and it's, we've been discussing, are there opportunities with the World Federation and FDI to be doing some joint advocacy work? Again, I look at the World Health Organization. I've gone on their website and looked at what they're doing around oral health as an issue. Chapter 9 of the uh, WHO report on equity, social determinants, and public health practice was dedicated to oral health. Yet how, many, how much resources in WHO are dedicated to oral health? I think someone was mentioning last night there's one half of a person dedicated to oral health in WHO. That's not a lot of resources. So how do we together advocate for a much stronger profile of oral health within WHO and get that out there? The third thing I think we can learn from uh, the tobacco uh, uh, experience is finding champions outside of the health sciences. And I think this is where the tobacco group really made inroads, was finding lay people who were affected by the tobacco situation and they became the champions, whether it was waitresses in Canada who had lung disease because of exposure to secondhand smoke, they became the spokespeople around tobacco and, and exposure. Uh, you know, can we find lay people in our countries who can become champions around oral health and talk about the issues not only at the individual level but at the community level. What does it mean for community health uh, to have good oral health in a community? What are, what, what are the benefits out of this? What are the paybacks? And finally, I'd just like to share with you again uh, the Canadian experience. We formed several years ago the Canadian Coalition for Public Health in the 21st Century. It's an alliance of 30 health professional organizations and I'm very pleased to say three of those organizations are dental related. One is the Canadian Dental Association, the second is the Canadian Dental Hygienist Association, and the third is the Canadian Association of, of Public Health Dentistry. So we have three dental organizations involved in a public health coalition, and we just brought out a fact sheet on oral health for Canada that we're going to be publishing quite widely. So I think, again, in our own countries, we can create coalitions with public health and with non-traditional dental groups to really get the message out there about the importance of oral health and particularly caries prevention. So what I take away from that is that if we're going to make caries more prominent, then dentistry should be perhaps working synergistically with other groups to make a difference rather than just a lone voice of dentists. I would advocate for that very strongly, yes. Right. And, and helping to educate us from outside of the field about the importance of oral health. I, as I said, I, don't, I think we've got it back here, but we need to be moving it up front, and, and we need to be coming advocates with you on the issue. And perhaps using the communication technology that Yami was referring to, which maybe we haven't yet. Donald, you had a point. Yeah, I, I was gonna talk about um, uh, sort of the tobacco uh, control. Besides, I think champions is a very good idea, but besides in the tobacco um, control, role models also, you know, prominent people, movie stars, entertainment, coming out to say, you know, sort of have you checked your teeth, that, that kind of thing, you know, that also helps. And the other side in the t tobacco control is the serious consequence, all right? We did mention some of the medical, I mean, 
tobacco is sort of easier because lung cancer, death, all right, carries, but still there are some serious medical con consequences, as I said, you know, aspiration pneumonia in, in elderly, and similar things, diabetes. Lastly, I mean, this is probably more of a joke, is, you know, a precaution on overuse of candies and all that, you know, just like smoking is hazardous to your health, you know, over use of, you know, sweets and all that may be hazardous to your, to your dental health. I know the message is sort of maybe modified or, or, or packaged better in, in this sense may help. So we, we start putting health warnings on packets. So a, any other experiences, what we can learn for dentistry struggling with the caries epidemic from outside of dentistry, from outside of caries? Yeah, that's it. I, I, I believe that, uh, you know, in, as you, we all know that um, uh, oral health is an uh, integral part of general health. Uh, we, we believe that. And then we, in Thailand, we said that mouth or the teeth is a gateway for, for, for health. So if we are just talking about uh, the, uh, the, uh, the caries in the teeth, you know, it's just only the mouth. It's not going to go out from, from, from the generator to, to the other, uh, other health problem. But actually, we all know that uh, in the caries, especially in children, can generate to many health problems uh, as well. So I think in order to make this is a serious uh, uh, problem, it has to generate up out of the oral cavity. It has to be generated out to the general health and generate up to the... We even, we, are uh, even we have some discussion uh, that uh, oral health or the, the caries, if they have a bad caries, uh, you know in, Tha in Thailand we have this what we call the uh, ECC, rich childhood caries, which has a lot of, uh, of, uh, of the teeth have been gone out even at very young, uh, at, at very young, and then have effect on the mastication. Uh, and then we have no, we, we have some study that uh, in Japan that mastication, mastication uh, in well, we have an uh, effect to the brain development, especially in uh, both in the elderly people and also in the young, uh, in the student as well. Something like this, you know, we, know, we, we need to make more emphasis and, and to, for the people, uh, for the publicity to know that uh, this is not only the oral cavity, this is not only in the, in the oral, but it will affect uh, the whole body in, in the future. Not only the health, but also the brain or whatsoever and the, uh, 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 the, the general, general quality of life in the future as well. So make it people more understand. So my takeaway from that is that we need more coalitions, more alliances between involved organizations and stakeholders, and we need some sort of better communication strategy to describe the disease and the impact of the disease and why it's important. And again, I'm not sure we have that across the board in caries, but we, we probably could do. We're limited for time. Uh, we've assembled this wonderful panel. Um, happy to take just a few quick questions if anybody has any burning desire before we move on to the last part, which is what should um, the FDI do? How can we take some of these issues forward? So if there are any questions, please come to the microphones. Good morning. Uh, thank you for a very nice uh, panel. My name is uh, Christopher Fox and I'm the executive director of the International Association for Dental Research. <clears throat> I have a specific question for uh, Dr. Chauvin, the president of the World Federation of, of uh, Public Health Associations. In February of this year, the uh, uh, World Federation of Public Health Associations co-signed a letter uh, supporting a phase out of dental amalgam, uh, co-signed with the Zero Mercury Group and others. This was sent to the um, EU ministers of health. We had a long session yesterday about dental amalgam and how we still need it. And we're talking about both the uh, prevention of dental caries as well as the management. And we still need dental amalgam in the view of this organization, our organization, IEDR. <clears throat> in April of uh, 2012, the American Public Health Association sent a follow-up letter to the World Federation disagreeing with this position or this co-signed letter and supporting the WHO position, which is a phase down of dental amalgam and that's the position that the FDI holds and the IDR uh, and others. So I'm just wondering if the World Federation of Public Health Association is still supporting a phase out of dental amalgam with timetables, or are they now supporting the WHO uh, position? We're actually in the process of reviewing that letter that you referred to in February, uh, and it's one of the things that I, I started as president in April, and it's one of the first things that I brought forward to our governing council. We're hoping in October uh, to be meeting with the American Public Health Association during their con conference in San Francisco to go through this letter and their position so that we can come up with a revised position on it. But we are sensitive to what, uh, what this is about. Yes, please, Stuart. 
thank you, uh, Stuart Johnston, uh, British Dental Association. Uh, I've heard the, uh, the, the elderly mentioned only once. Would you, uh, the panel, like to reflect on the pressure that the increasingly aged population of some countries is going to place on their healthcare systems and whether we can manage to introduce prevention to try and help deal with some of the operative needs that we've got in people with very established habits and sometimes with dexterity problems, polypharmacy, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. So perhaps an economic view? Yeah, I, um, one of my research interests focus on people with um, Alzheimer's and dementia. So I think um, in the case of caries prevention, um, I think we have to think about different patient groups. For example, in patients with Alzheimer's dementia, self-care can be really problematic, um, as well as medication adherence. So we have to tailor individual needs and um, to focus, to have different strategies for a different um, patient population. Um, another point I want to make is um, public education. It's not patient education, but public education like we were discussing yesterday. Um, because a lot of people are not aware of the consequences of dental um, ca caries. Um, and um, I think we have to make um, better communication to educate um, the public about different aspects and different um, um, prevention strategies, um, not just for healthcare professionals, but also for the public. I think we, um, we're going to take one last question from, from Dan Meyer in a moment. I think you raise a really important point, which we, we don't want to gloss over. We just haven't got time. Caries is a problem for young children. Caries is a problem for adolescents. Caries is a problem for the middle age groups, but it's an absolute nightmare for the increasing numbers of elderly people with retained teeth, and some with complex restorative work, some without. And the, the practicalities and the ways of coping with that we can't cope with that in a restorative and surgical model, but we have to find ways of doing that in a preventive context, and I don't think we're anything like there yet, particularly when those people are inaccessible. So, very useful point, thank you. Dan, if you could give us the last yes, question. I'll try to make this brief also, but I would like also to follow up on Dr. Fox's question uh, from IADR to uh, WFPHA. And the letter that was sent out in February seem to represent a number of public health associations. And my question is, um, was, was organized dentistry sought for input? Uh, were uh, regulatory agencies that have expertise, uh, like the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, Centers for Disease Control, or recognized bodies that have um, health authority uh, sought in when that letter was developed? brief answer was no. It, we did not do due diligence, and I will admit that. So we are now going back and hopefully redoing the due diligence process better. Okay. And on behalf of the American Dental Association, uh, we'd love to be able to provide some expertise on that. Can I just point out, actually, the, the World Federation, we just struck a oral health working group this year, and it was endorsed in April at our governing, uh, at our General Assembly. So this is going to hopefully be one mechanism that we've put in place that we will have a better uh, process around our policy and positions within the Federation uh, of being able to call on expertise when it's needed rather than having an individual taking the, the um, making a position statement on our behalf. So it's a two-way street. We are learning from public health and we're also feeding into their processes. So the communication, I think, is needed and it's happening. There are some exciting developments there. Could I call a upon Orlando just really to say in terms of the FDI, how does the FDI respond to these issues going forward? Thank you. Well, I think uh, having capacity to integrate all these groups, all these ap approaches, I'm very sensitive, for instance, for the issue of, of having more public health inside the FDI. I mean, you're contribute your reflection that you don't have in an effective way with collaboration from the profession, of course, can be a, a major issue. The latest WHO developments in terms of the 
chronic diseases approach can be a huge opportunity for public health with the profession to reflect on, 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 on this topic. Uh, the issue of the studies, information, mapping, uh, classification issue, all of those topics, some of them we are working with them, are very, very important. It's very difficult to, it's easy to describe in a general way the disease tooth decay, but it's very difficult to have the other groups recognizing it and being capable to, uh, uh, to, to, to measure the severity of the disease. So this is one more topic where we can work with. Uh, regarding also, I don't know if the, the, uh, the colleague from Tufts, uh, in terms of economical uh, approach, we don't have much in terms of the economical impact of the disease. Perhaps we should work together on this topic. Perhaps, of course, the issue of, of funding for economic disease is an important one, but I don't see any reason why the FDI and others cannot allocate the appropriate resources to work with skilled people on that economical aspect. Uh, intervention nowadays is made of figures, of numbers, of, of very objective issues, and we have tremendous difficulty on explaining that to stakeholders, politicians, decision makers. If we could go back to the slides. Um, I'd just like to wrap up and thank uh, the panel. But before I do, um, last night, uh, Yaimi said we were being too passive and not radical enough. So I thought I'd share with you some of the goals that the Alliance for Cavity Free Future has. And that's by 2015, 90% of dental schools and dental associations should have embraced this new approach to caries. By 2020, chapters that the Alliance is forming should have integrated locally appropriate comprehensive prevention and management systems in place. And most importantly, every child born in 2026 should stay cavity free during their lifetime. If we're gonna make those sorts of things happen, then I think, as we've heard, we've got to change. We've got to change the way we work and start to liaise with other people. And this, these are the take home messages that we discussed a little bit uh, last evening with the panel. And uh, again, I think a very healthy debate. We were told that some of you may already be doing this. And if you're doing all of this, wonderful. Come and tell us about it. Because we need some change to the traditional attitudes. We need active involvement of other stakeholders. We need better quality periodic surveillance. We need to inform and engage, and I think you heard that from the panel today, all health professionals, as well as patients and the public, about what is a preventable disease. We need to achieve more effective caries control. We're not there yet using both primary and secondary prevention to implement what we know works in ways that are locally appropriate, and that's both upstream and downstream. And the last part, which I think is a role for the FDI and others, is to support the dental team as well as the wider health profession through this sort of change with not only appropriate education, but with remuneration incentives to dentists and the dental team, but also to the other health professionals Otherwise, we're not gonna get sustainable change. So I would like to acknowledge the time, effort, and expertise that the panel members have put in. Um, it's been a, a wonderful conversation. Thank you all very much. And could you join with me in thanking the panel? I'd like to thank the FDI for putting on this particular forum and to thank Colgate Palmolives for supporting this session. Thank you all very much.